And it was through Professor Hinslow that the most important event of my life came to be. You see, uh, Captain Robert Fitzroy had taken a voyage around the tip of South America to chart the waters of South America some years before. And he had returned to England uh, to refit his ship, the Beagle, and then set out on another voyage. But while Fitzroy was going to be charting the oceans, he was looking for a gentleman naturalist who could also go with him to describe the natural history of the geology of the land. So while Fitzroy was on the seas, the naturalist would be on the land. He offered this position to Hinslow. But instead of taking it, Hinslow recommended, of all people, me, to go on this voyage. I, I was thrilled with the idea. I was completely thrilled until I told my father and he thought it was the most ridiculous idea he'd ever heard. We had words, we, we argued, and at the end he said, Charles, if you can find one man of good common sense who thinks this is a good idea, then I will let you go. Well, I immediately thought of my Uncle Josiah Wedgwood. My father often said there was no man who had better common sense than Uncle Joe's. So I ran to Uncle Joe's home, and I told him what the opportunity was. And to my great delight, he thought it was a wonderful idea. And I asked him if he would travel to my father's home and tell him so. And he did that very well. He took his carriage immediately, he drove the 30 miles, and told my father this would be the making of Charles. Well, of course, at that point, my father could not argue anymore. <laughs> I know he was still upset. So I said, well, father, when I was at Cambridge, you grew rather upset because I overspent my allowance. I would have to be deuced clever to overspend my allowance a hundred miles at sea. And my father looked at me and said, yes, Charles, but they say you are deuced clever. So even then he got the last word on me. I have always thought that here, this voyage, which was the most defining moment of my life, hung on two things. One was the willingness of my uncle Josiah to drive that 30 miles to see my father. That allowed me to go. But there was one other incident, which I only found out about later, and that was the shape of my nose. For you see, Captain Fitzroy believed he could read the character of people by the shape of their noses. And he felt, after our interview, that my nose was simply not the right shape to indicate a man of the determination and uh, genuine strength necessary for multiple years on the high seas. Now, you must understand, he was right to be cautious. The former captain of the Beagle, before Fitzroy took over, actually fell into such despondency off the coast of South America that he shot himself. To be on a ship that long with a small number of men, often in trying circumstances, is no small thing. But somehow, I was able to convince Fitzroy that my nose was speaking falsely, and he took me on. <laughs> in the end, it was not my nose I should have worried about, but my stomach. Because after we left the shores of England, I soon found out that I was prone to seasickness. And I spent much of the voyage in my hammock, in my small quarters, six feet by ten feet. My hammock hung above the large chart table. So during the day, I had to bring my hammock down so we could work on the chart table and hang it again, pull the drawer out so my feet could extend long enough so I could actually be straight out. And I spent many, many hours moaning and groaning in that uh, hammock of mine, I assure you. When we got into port, I was the first one off the boat. And I was the last one to board it when we were about to leave. <laughs> the Beagle. The Beagle was what they called a coffin brig. A coffin brig. They called it that because 
The ship did not handle well in high seas and often had a tendency to sink. Now luckily, uh, Captain Fitzroy had been on the Beagle the year before, so he fitted her out by raising the deck an entire foot, for he knew in high seas that would be an incredibly important thing to do, to keep the water from on deck so she would handle better. But 90 feet long and 24 feet in the beam. Think about it. For a man of my size, 90 feet from stern to bow, 30 paces. 30 paces from stern to bow, eight paces from one side to the other of the ship. 30 up, 30 back, eight across, eight across. That was my world for months at a time. And to be seasick on top of it. Remember that. <laughs> In spite of that, that voyage, as I said, was the making of me.